You're all very welcome this morning. Um, a few announcements. Uh, we'll meet this evening again uh, at 6.30 on Zoom when we'll be having a time of prayer. And then on Tuesday at 11 o'clock, uh, we're having another viewing of our potential building. So uh, James Snodgrass is going along with one or two others. So if anybody would like to come at that time to, ha- to see it, uh, you're welcome to come at 11 on Tuesday. That's to 13 Pump Street. And then we'll have our midweek uh, on Thursday evening at, at 8 o'clock on Zoom. And it'll be the next part of Genesis. I forgot to check just uh, what it was this morning, but it'll be the next bit of Genesis <coughs> that we've been studying. Okay, uh, we'll come to worship God and we'll... Our first praise is from Psalm 95, Psalm 95, uh, verses 1 to 6, to the tune Irish 101. Psalm 95, verses 1 to 6. This is the psalm that encourages us and exhorts us to come. Uh, and to praise God with our voices, to lift our voices in praise to him. And it gives us some reasons why we should uh, worship and praise God. It, in stanza three, it talks about him, uh, the Lord being a great God and a great king. And then it speaks of him as the creator uh, in verse four. To him the sea belongs, for he hath made by his command, and he the dry land fashioned by the working of his hands. Well, he not only made uh, the world that we see around us, but he made us as well. And so... Uh, we see that in stanza five. Well, come and let us worship him, and let us bow down to him. Come, let us kneel before the Lord, who is our maker true. So he is our maker, and uh, he's also our shepherd, then we see in stanza six. Because he only is our God, and so we are his sheep, people of his shepherding, whom his own hand will keep. So let's uh, stand. We'll stand and praise God. Uh, Psalm 95, 1 to 6, and remain standing for prayer.
Okay, let's uh, come to the Lord in prayer. Let's, let's pray. Lord, your Father, we thank you that we can come into your holy presence in the morning of your day to worship you. We thank you that you have given us voices to sing praise to you. Uh, we thank you that you've given us words to sing. And we, we thank you that we are free to come today to worship you. There is none uh, to stop us. Uh, we, are, we are free to gather and to bring you our worship and our praise. But we thank you, O Lord, that you are worthy uh, of all of our worship and all of our praise. For you are uh, the creator. You're a great God. You are a great king, the great king. You're the one who has made everything that we see around us. And you're the one who has made us. Uh, you are our creator and we worship you as our creator. We thank you that you're also as uh, you're also our shepherd. We thank you that through the Lord Jesus Christ you have brought uh, many of us to uh, trust in Him, and He is our shepherd, the good shepherd who cares for His sheep. And so we worship you as our shepherd today, also, Lord. We thank you that you've given us your word to instruct us and to teach us. And as we consider your word today, as uh, we think about a particular passage from the Old Testament. We pray that you would speak to us through it and that you would be our teacher by your Holy Spirit. So we pray that you would be honoured and glorified through all that we do today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to read today from 1 Samuel chapter 17. It's a long chapter, we'll not read absolutely all of it, but we'll read most of it, so it will uh, take us a little month or two. And uh, Samuel and Thomas, uh, later after this, you're going to come up to these two chairs at the front, and I'm going to do a little quiz with you about some of the things we're reading about. So um, if you listen as carefully as you can, I'll, I'll tell you when we get to the bits that I'll be asking you about, so that you can listen particularly carefully. So we'll read from uh, 1 Samuel 17, and first verse. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Sokoth in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Damon between Sokoth and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath who was from Gath came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall he had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of, of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and his iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man. And have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistine's words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now David was the son of, of an Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem and Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time he was old and well advanced in years. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second Aminadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For forty days the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Now Jesse said to his son David, Take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers, and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah, fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock with the shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle position, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines, facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and greeted his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. 
Now the Israelites had been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, This is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you lead those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter, and the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight. And Samuel Thomas, you listen carefully now because it's this bit that I'll be asking you some questions about. Uh, David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight. Saul replied, You are not able to go against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy, and he has been a fighting man from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go on these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took a staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of a shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with a seal bearer in front of him, kept, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, but the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the scabbard. After he killed him, he cut off his head with a sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Akron. Okay, we'll, we'll finish our reading there. Right, okay, Samuel Thomas can come up to these two, two chairs. I have a quiz for you here. That's right. Okay. Now, first question is, don't, don't answer this until I show you the pictures, okay? Oh, Technical hitch. animals did David, did David look after? So I'm going to show you some animals. Don't tell me which is, which is the right answer until you've seen them all. There's three different, you have a choice of three. So was it those kind of animals? Yes. 
Are you sure they're not goats? Yeah, well, there might be rams in there too, but yes, those are sheep. Um, uh, okay, so what about these? Do they look after any of those? No. Uh, why, what are they? Pigs, yeah, and what about these? Maybe he looked after some of those. Chickens. No, that's right, they're chickens. So yes, he looked after sheep. Now, try not to give me the answer until you've seen all three pictures, okay? This time. Now, what animals do they sometimes have to fight to protect yeah. us in? No, don't wait, just wait, wait till you see the pictures, I'll see, and then I'm going to see three of them, three pictures, and you have to tell me which one's wrong. Yeah. Right, that one? Yeah. That one? Yeah. And that uh -huh. one? Yeah. What's that one? Hyena. Right. Yeah. Well, maybe they'd have to, maybe they'd have to protect the sheep from hyenas as well, but it does that's right, there's vultures in the background, very good. Um, we don't read that he had, in the Bible that he didn't mention hyenas, but they may well have had to protect the sheep from hyenas as well, so, okay. And vultures. Vultures too, yeah. Now, what weapons did he use against Goliath? I'm going to show you th three things, and just, wait till you see them all first, and then you can tell me whether he used, did he use one of those? What's that? What is it? Tell me what it is first. Spear. A spear, okay. And what's, what's this? A sling. And, and what about bow? Oh. What, what about those? What are they? Bow and arrows. Bow and arrows. Did he use any of those? No. No. So he used, he used the sling, didn't he? That's what you're telling me. Right. Okay, let's see. Go a bit further. Now, here's a question. Why did David believe that he would beat Goliath? Was it, I'm giving you three, 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 three things. Was it because he knew that Goliath was a very bad fighter? Or was it because he knew that, that David would, himself was a very good shot with a sling and a stone? Or was it because he believed that God would be with him and help him? Yeah, he believed that God would be with him. Yeah, that's that. right. That's right. And we'll just read out the verse that, uh, where he says that. Now, see if I can find it again. Your servant, this is what David said to Saul, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. So that was why he believed that he would be able to beat Goliath because he believed that God would be with him as he had been with him before. And we can we can trust in God in that to help us too. When we're facing difficult situations, we can uh, trust that God would help us if we ask him. Okay, you can go back to your seats now. Thank you. <laughs> okay, our second psalm of praise then is is uh, Psalm fifty six. Psalm fifty six. Uh, the tune is humility. What uh, numbers the tune have, humility? 100. So Psalm 56 to the tune 100, we're going to be singing stanzas 1 to 3, and then 7 to 9. Stanzas 1 to 3 and, and 7 to 9. You'll have gathered that we're going to be thinking about David and his fight against Goliath. Uh, today, and this was a psalm that David wrote uh, at a subsequent time in his life when he was facing the Philistines. And you'll see he talks about uh, in stanza three, when I'm afraid, I'll trust in you, in God I'll praise his word, in God I trust, as for mere man, he'll not make me afraid. Uh, David is uh, admitting here that there are times when he is afraid, uh, and at those times, that's when he, he puts his trust particularly in the Lord. And I'm sure as he went out to face Goliath, uh, David didn't go out, but he, I believe that he was afraid, but he, he put his trust in the Lord, and uh, that's what made him willing to go and to put himself in danger uh, for the sake of the Lord's glory. So let's, let's sing these, these words and God's praise. Stances 1 to 3 and 7 to 9, and then we'll remain standing again for prayer afterwards.
failed you uh, in these past days in our thoughts and our words and in our actions and we uh, we have not lived up to uh, the standards that you have set for us and we seek your cleansing and your forgiveness for that. Uh, we thank you that you've provided for us uh, many good things to enjoy. We thank you that you've provided uh, all the necessities of life and, and, and much more besides and we thank you that we can come and gather together around your word to think about uh, what you, what you would say to us through your word. And we pray that you would indeed speak to us today. We pray that you would bless uh, your people meeting in other places today. We think of those who are uh, representing us in France and in Spain. And as they uh, meet for worship today, we pray that they would know your blessing and your help. And we pray that you would build your church uh, in those places and bless uh, your servants who work there and who bring the word uh, in the French and in the Spanish languages to the, the people there uh, on your day. Lord, we, uh, we pray for your people throughout the world who uh, live in countries where it is dangerous, particularly dangerous to be a Christian, and where they either cannot meet together or they, have, they do meet where it is dangerous for them to meet. And we pray that they would know your presence today, whether they are on their own or whether they are meeting with others. We pray that they would know your blessing and your help, and we pray that you continue to bless uh, the work of your kingdom throughout the world. We pray that you would continue to add men and women and young people to it today as, as they believe the gospel. Uh, we just uh, remember <coughs> Stephen, our pastor at this time, we thank you for uh, the operation he had yesterday and thank you that he is uh, making good recovery and we just pray that he would uh, get over that quickly and be able to resume his normal uh, duties and be with him as he prepares to preach here next Lord's Day. Uh, we just pray for uh, others in the congregation who have particular needs you know particular needs of, of those within the congregation and in our uh, family circles and we just commit them to you, uh, those who have particular issues at the moment, we pray that you would 
be near to them and bless them and, and uh, be at work in their lives uh, through all the difficult circumstances that, that you bring into their lives. So, O oh Lord, we uh, commit ourselves into your loving care now and pray for your help uh, as we continue together. In Jesus' name, amen. Most of us usually like to see an underdog winning, unless, of course, the underdog, underdog is playing against our particular team. Uh, in, in 1950, the USA uh, played England in the early stages of the World Cup football tournament in Brazil. England at that time were, were massive favourites because they had a reputation at that time as being the kings of football. It was the era of some of the big names of, of English football history, like Billy Wright and Stanley Matthews and Stan Mortensen and so on. In, compar in comparison, the Americans had lost their last seven uh, matches by a combined score of 45 goals against the 2-4. Uh, they had been beaten heavily by Italy, 7-1, Norway, 11-0, and even Northern Ireland had beaten them 5-0. Their team was a gather-up of part-time players who had played together only once before the tournament. However, in the second game of their, their second game of that tournament, they pulled off one of the biggest shocks in the tournament's history by beating the massive favourites England by one goal to nil. And the game later got the Hollywood treatment in a, a film called The Miracle Match. Now, the story goes that uh, when the English uh, paper, some of the English papers heard the news of the scoreline, uh, they Communications weren't quite as, as slick as they are nowadays, and they heard of the 1 0 scoreline. They assumed that there was a, a typing error, and, and they published the result as a 10 0 victory for England. Uh, and I'm sure that once they got around to actually accepting the score and the truth of the result, they, did, they would have described it as a, a David against Goliath, uh, a David beating Goliath uh, match. And even if you aren't a Christian, and know nothing about the Bible, everybody knows about David beating Goliath, and it has become the standard way of describing uh, the underdog triumphing over uh, against overwhelming odds, whether in the field of sport or business or, or politics or, or even war. And uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the story of, of David and Goliath, and because of that, I took me a bit of time convincing myself that it was a good idea to try to preach on it, uh, and especially since some of the commentators that I read uh, often spoke about its meaning being widely misunderstood. Uh, so uh, I hope I won't add to that misunderstanding this morning. Let's remind ourselves, first of all, a little bit of the background uh, under the heading, The Philistines, a thorn in Israel's side. The Philistines, a thorn in Israel's side. The Philistines had been around uh, for a long time, and they had increasingly become a problem for the people of God. We first hear of them in the book of Genesis, when from time to time they rub shoulders with Abraham and Isaac uh, and their contemporaries. They lived on the coastal Mediterranean coastal plain of, of southern Palestine. We hear of them again when the children of Israel were leaving uh, the land of Egypt. Uh, in Exodus 13, verse 17, we read that God doesn't allow the Israelites to go to the, to the promised land through Philistine territory even though that was the most direct route, uh, in case that they would, ha in having to fight the Philistines, they would lose heart and uh, decide to go back to Egypt. And as we know, it didn't take that much uh, to put them off and to make them think that way. We find the Philistines then again as, as Israel's enemies in the book of Judges, when sometimes because of the sin of, of God's people, God gives the Philistines do domination over his people. And then at other times, God raises up judges like um, like Samson, who is victorious over the Philistines, uh, especially in his death. And then when we come to the book of 1 Samuel, uh, we find a bit of a roller coaster ride as far as the Israelites and the Philistines are concerned. First of all, the Philistines are victorious and they capture the Ark of the Covenant in chapter 4. And then later God gives Israel a great victory over the Philistines under the leadership of Samuel. Uh, but then the Philistines regroup again and they become powerful. And this time, uh, God gives victory 
And this time it's Saul's son, the King Saul's son, Jonathan, who's the hero. And we read about that in chapter 14. Both of these victories that uh, the Israelites had over the Philistines were miraculous. In the first one, God sent a great thunderstorm to confuse the Philistines and they, uh, they panicked uh, and were defeated. And in the second time, God gave Israel victory even though uh, the Israelites had no weapons. We, we read that only Saul and Jonathan had, had weapons, proper weapons, swords and spears and things. Because the Philistines had been so dominant that they, uh, they had made sure there were no blacksmiths in the land of Israel. And so the Israelites weren't able to make themselves metal uh, weapons like swords and spears. And it was only Saul and Jonathan who had weapons. And yet God gave a great victory through Jonathan and his armor bearer who uh, made a surprise attack. And once again, the Philistines panicked and fled and uh, Israel had a great victory. So that's the, that's the background. Now we come to 1 Samuel 17. And once again, the Philistines have gathered for battle against the Israelites. And they face the Israelite army across the valley of Elah. What will God do this time, we wonder? Now, uh, we read most of chapter 17, and it's a long chapter. And there, there's much that we could uh, speak about from uh, 1 Samuel 17. But I want to hang our thoughts today on the idea of four champions. Four champions. Uh, we're introduced to the, the word champion in verse 4, although I think in the NIV it doesn't actually use the word champion in verse 4. And I made the mistake of not reading the passage in the NIV. I prepared it from, from the ESV and New King James. But um, the idea of a champion, um, apparently the Hebrew word literally means a man between the two. And that's what Goliath was calling for. He's calling for a champion to come out. Um, Goliath explains it quite well. He says, no point having all this bloodshed between the two armies. Uh, why not have a champion from each side to enter into single-handed combat and save, save all the bloodshed from the rest of the army? And the winner uh, takes it all. So we're going to look at the idea of, of four champions. And we have, first of all, the Philistines' arrogant champion. The Philistines' arrogant champion. I'm sure you're all familiar with the, uh, the details of Goliath. First of all, he is huge, measuring six cubits in a span, which is over nine feet uh, in old money, or three meters to those of you who are into metric measurement. And even viewed across the Elah Valley, uh, he's an impressive sight. And then there's his armor, a bronze helmet, a coat of scale armor to cover his body, bronze greaves on his legs. And we're told the weight of it, 5,000 shekels, mightn't mean much to us today, but it apparently translates into 57 kilos, or more than two bags of coal. Uh, so quite a lot of weight just to carry around on your body to protect you, never mind having to carry your weapons as well. And speaking of his weapons, we read that his spear was like a weaver's beam, the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And again, I'm not sure how much that conveys to the modern reader, but it seems to be a commonly used idiom in scripture. We read of a few other warriors who had spears like weaver's beams, uh, one of them being Goliath's brother. Uh, so that a weaver's beam obviously was very thick, it was a very thick handled spear that a, an ordinary man could barely get his hand around. And it had to be strong because the, the head of a spear weighed 600 shekels, uh, which is seven kilos. So Goliath could have done a lot of damage uh, with that sort of weapon, a weapon which normal men could lift but could never wield in battle. And if that wasn't enough then, he had a javelin swung across his back and even had a shield bearer to go in front of him to protect him. His armor, of course, doesn't offer adequate protection to the one place that it turns out he's going to need it, his forehead. Now, whether Philistine armor didn't uh, protect that part of the, the head properly or whether Goliath just didn't see any need uh, to have his head protector or his forehead protector on, we're not sure. Uh, as he saw a, a boy approaching, one writer suggests that uh, Goliath laughed so much that his head protector flew off and it had, hadn't got around to putting it back on again. Now, I think that's a bit of imagination being used there, but for one reason or another, his forehead wasn't as well protected as it needed to be, and that was his downfall. His appearance is scary enough, uh, but then he opens his mouth uh, and uh, defies the Israelites to provide this man, to provide a champion to fight him in one-to-one -one combat. What he is really doing is defying the God of Israel. 
and it is blasphemy against the true God that is his chief sin. David identifies this in his dramatic speech that he makes as he approaches Goliath. Uh, he identifies that what Goliath is doing is, is, is being uh, issuing blasphemy against the Lord of hosts. And it's interesting that the punishment for blasphemy in Israel was death by stoning. And that's exactly how Goliath dies. He dies by a single stone, accurately slung and directed by the providence of God to that vulnerable spot on his unprotected or inadequately protected forehead. So Goliath comes out and he issues this challenge every morning and every evening for 40 days. And in the Bible, 40 days, when you read about 40 days, it's usually an indication that this is some sort of a test. Remember, Jesus was 40 days and 40 nights uh, being tempted by Satan in the wilderness. And Goliath uh, issues this challenge morning and evening for 40 days. It was, it was a test. It was a test of the faith of the people of Israel, a test that they so far had failed. In the words of uh, preacher Alistair Begg, that Goliath's challenge was a test of whether they believed their beliefs or not. They would have claimed that their God was almighty, that he was the God of hosts, but did they actually really believe it when they were faced with what seemed like an impossible <coughs> challenge in the shape of Goliath? The fact that nobody was willing to take on Goliath's challenge suggests that they didn't believe their beliefs. Uh, they didn't really believe that their God was the Lord God Almighty. What about us? Do we really believe our beliefs? We've all, or most of us, have made a profession of faith, but do we really believe uh, what we profess? Uh, it's only when we're in a situation where her, when our, our faith is tested, whether through some sort of trial uh, or through uh, opposition or persecution, uh, that we can see whether our faith really is genuine or not. And maybe that's why God brings these things into our lives sometimes, to, to test our faith, to prove whether our faith is real or not. Not to prove to God that it's real, because he knows. He knows everything. He knows whether, whether we are true and genuine followers of Jesus Christ or not. But to prove it to, our, to us, uh, to prove it to us whether our faith is real. So David, uh, as David went out to face Goliath, he was putting his faith to the test. He was putting himself in harm's way for the sake of God's glory. And he was showing that his faith was real. Who is this man Goliath then? What's his significance? Well, first of all, we should stress that he is, and he was a real man. This is not a legend or a fairy story. Uh, this was a real battle in a real place. If you go on a tour to the land of Israel, you can go and you can see the Valley of Elah and see the locality where these events took place. But he was a real man, but in a sense he was more than a real man. He was, if you like, Satan's man at that time, out to destroy the people of God. A.W. Pink, a famous uh, theologian from the first half of the 20th century, says, Goliath pictures to us the great enemy of God and man, the devil, seeking to terrify and bring into captivity those who bear the name of the Lord. Remember uh, the words of God in Genesis 3 to Satan, where he speaks about the conflict between Satan and the seed of the woman, who would ultimately at the cross destroy the head of the serpent. The story of the, of the rest of the Bible, including 1 Samuel, is the story of that conflict uh, between Satan and the seed of the woman. And Satan does his best to destroy the line of the Messiah in a futile attempt uh, to prevent the coming of the son of the woman who would finally destroy him. And Goliath, at this point in history, is, is, Satan's, is the embodiment of Satan's attempt to wipe out the Old Testament people of God. Some writers make quite a bit of the fact that his armor is described as scale armor. And you know what kind of animals have scales? What kind of animals have scales, Samuel, Thomas? You know what kind of animal has scales? Yeah. Snakes have scales, that's right. Uh, and you remember how Satan in the Garden of Eden presented himself uh, as a serpent, as a snake. Uh, so several writers believe that by describing his armor as scale armor, uh, we're meant to be reminded that this is really uh, Satan's representative here that is defying God and his people. So we have Philistine's arrogant champion. We move then on to Israel's alarmed champion. Israel's alarmed champion. The king of Israel was King Saul. 
Back in 1 Samuel 8, the people had pestered the prophet Samuel and they wanted a king. And despite Samuel telling them all the drawbacks of a king and all the, the difficulties that a king would bring into their lives, they insisted that, no, they wanted a king. No, they say, we want a king over us. Then we'll be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. And Saul was chosen and anointed as that first king. And he certainly looked the part. He was head and shoulders above all the rest of the men in Israel. He was the most impressive man in the whole country. So where, where was he? Where was this king? Why was he not doing what kings were meant to do uh, and leading his people into battle? You'd expect if anybody was going to fight against Goliath, it would be, it would be Saul, this anointed king. But where is he? Well, he's cowering in his tent. We read in verse 11 that when Saul and all Israel heard Goliath's words, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So instead of taking the lead and taking on Goliath, Saul has introduced an incentive scheme uh, to the man brave enough to take on and to kill this Philistine champion. It's a three-tier scheme. Uh, riches, the hand of a royal princess in marriage, and a family tax exemption for life. And these are all an offer to the man who defeats the giant. It's a generous offer. Uh, not that any of those things will be much good to you when you're dead. Uh, but Saul hopes that there'll be somebody brave enough to fight Goliath and to kill him. But it's definitely not going to be him, whether he's Israel's champion or not. Uh, there isn't a queue of people uh, queuing up uh, to apply for this position. And from a human viewpoint, we can understand Saul's fear, his alarm. And to be honest, the human viewpoint is all that Saul is left with at this time. In chapter 15, we read of his disobedience to God and of how God had rejected him as king over Israel. He no longer has any right to exact, expect a miraculous deliverance from the Philistines uh, like they had experienced in the past. We might wonder, uh, where is Jonathan uh, at this point? Jonathan, who with God's help had been such a heroic deliverer just a few chapters earlier. Or where were all the mighty men that Saul had gathered around him? We read uh, in Samuel, 1 Samuel 14, 52, that whenever he came across a, a valiant man, he brought him into his service. Where were all these great and mighty men uh, when they were needed? We can only assume that they followed the example of their leader. His fears had become their fears. Richard Phillips, who we, whose books we have studied a few times in our, our, our evening Bible studies, says that God's spirit had departed from Saul and he was left to his own limited resources. As Saul gazed slack-jawed and glassy-eyed at Goliath, the army fed off his giant-sized panic. So the way the leader was was the way that his followers were. If the meaning of a champion was the man between the two, Saul wasn't much of a champion. He wasn't putting himself between his people and the enemy. He was leading from behind. So that was Israel's alarm champion. We come in the third place then uh, to God's anointed champion. God's anointed champion. David had already been anointed as God's king by Samuel in the previous chapter, chapter 16, following on God's abandonment of Saul as king. However, it was, it was a secret anointing. Not Saul didn't know about it yet, nor anybody apart from David's family. What can we say about God's anointed champion, David? Well, first of all, he was an, un, an unlikely champion. He was too young to meet the minimum age requirements for the army, and everybody seemed to want to point out his youth. The writer of 1 Samuel twice tells us that he was the youngest of Jesse's sons, and we've read about how his eldest brother Eliab treats him like a, a young upstart. And Saul, when David goes to Saul, Saul points out that he's too young and too inexperienced to fight Goliath, and even Goliath himself seems to be offended uh, by the fact that a youth has been sent against him. So he was an unlikely champion. And of course, people coming to that conclusion were falling into the same trap that God had uh, taught the prophet Samuel about in 1 Samuel 16. You remember when Samuel went to anoint one of Jesse's sons to be the new king, 
that uh, when Jesse uh, brought his sons before Samuel and Samuel saw the eldest son, Eliab, Samuel was very impressed with his appearance and he thought, this is surely the one that God has chosen. Uh, but God says to Samuel, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And that's what everybody was doing with David. To look at his outward appearance, he didn't look like a giant killer, but it was what was in his heart that qualified him for this particular task. So he was an unlikely champion. He was also an opposed champion. His brother uh, was against him, embarrassed perhaps, uh, because his cowardice and lack of faith were shown up uh, by David, his, his little brother. Uh, you'll notice that in the story that David is the very first one to mention uh, God in the whole situation. Uh, everybody was panicking about, about Goliath and, and uh, the great uh, scary person that he was, but nobody had mentioned God up to this point until David introduces the God of Israel into the discussion. So he was an opposed champion. He was opposed by Saul initially too. Saul didn't want him to go because he thought he was then unable. But we can say that he was a prepared champion. Uh, David had no experience of warfare, but he had experience of danger and meeting danger with God's help. As we were saying with, the, uh, with Samuel and Thomas, his shepherding experience in the wilderness <coughs> had put him in, in situations where the, for the safety and the well-being of a sheep, he had to put himself in dangerous situations. And in those times, the God in whom he trusted had given him success. And he was able to fight off lions and bears in defense of his sheep. So David saw his life experiences as God's preparations for the next stage of his service for God. And we, if, our God, if we are God's people, we should uh, do the same. Maybe we feel that what we do day by day, whether in the home or in the workplace, isn't that terribly significant in the great scheme of things. But perhaps those mundane tasks that we do from day to day are God's way of preparing us uh, for some future service uh, of a more significant nature. David's humble task of looking after his father's sheep came pretty low in the league table of important jobs in Israel. But with the eye of faith, David saw that looking after sheep had prepared him for the most important, the most significant day of his life, a day when he would defend his his human sheep, the people of Israel, uh, from attacks by this Philistine giant. He was also an unarmed champion, unarmed that is in the conventional way. Saul tried to remedy that by providing some of his own armor, but David rejects it and heads out to meet Goliath, a heavily armed and heavily protected Goliath with just his staff in one hand and a sling in the other and five smooth stones from the stream. He was, of course, armed in a different way, for he had spiritual armor, like the shield of faith, and above all, he had the Spirit of God, which had come upon him at his anointing uh, to be with him. So while he was unarmed in the conventional sense, he was armed in a much more important way. He was also a concerned for God's glory champion. What was it that motivated David to fight Goliath? What was his chief concern? Was it not that God, his God, Israel's God, the God of the armies of, of Israel, the living God, was being defied and blasphemed by Goliath? See what he says in verse 26. What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You can, you can just hear David's anger and his... Uh, disgust that this should be happening. Again in verse 45 as he approaches Goliath he says you come against me with sword and spear and javelin but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. Unlike Saul and many of the army of Israel David's concern was the honour and the glory of his God. I wonder what about us? How do we react when God's name is dishonoured in our hearing, or God's people, or God's church is mocked? Do we car in our tents uh, like Saul, or like David? Are we pained when we hear present-day Goliath belittling and dishonoring God's name, or God's people, or God's church? Are we pained enough so that, like David, we are brave enough, when appropriate, to challenge those who are daring to defy the living God? 
So he was a concern for God's glory champion. He was a faithful champion. Did David succeed where Saul and the mighty men of Israel failed because he was more courageous or because he had confidence in his ability with a sling and stone? Alistair Begg asked the question, why did David take five stones with him? Because we know he only used the one. And he suggests it was maybe because David was a humble lad and he didn't know if he would hit Goliath with the first stone. That may or may not be the case, but uh, his confidence wasn't in his own ability uh, or his skill. It was because he had faith in a great God and he believed that God would help him just as he'd helped him in the past when he faced the lion or the bear. Unlike Saul and many of the rest of the army, he actually believed his beliefs and he was prepared to put them to the test and put himself in danger as a result. Finally then, God's anointed champion was a victorious champion. A great victory was achieved not just over Goliath, but over the whole Philistine army, uh, because they were routed when they saw that their champion uh, was, had gone down. Uh, they, they suddenly uh, panicked and ran, and the rest of the Israelites then uh, joined in the chase. So David was a real hero of faith, and we can take heart when we face difficult situations that the God who helped David and gave him victory can give us victory too. He was a hero of faith, but he was also a picture for us of our final champion, and that is God's absolute champion, the Lord Jesus Christ. God's absolute champion. As David runs to meet Goliath, the embodiment of Satan's opposition to the people of God, he surely pictures for us Jesus, the seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent. Jesus was the ultimate anointed one, because that's what the word Messiah means. Like David, he too was an unlikely champion. In the words of Isaiah, there was no beauty in him that we should desire him. The people of Israel of his day, for the most part, didn't see him as the anointed one. They were looking for a Messiah who would lead them in battle and free them from the power of the Roman overlords, not one who would end up dying a cursed death on the cross. Jesus, like David, was an opposed champion. The religious authorities of his day were always on the lookout uh, for ways of getting rid of him. And as they led him out to be crucified, they thought they had succeeded. Just as the Israelites looking on and watching David going out to face Goliath uh, probably thought that he was doomed. There was no way he was going to win. So the religious authorities thought they had the victory over this troublesome preacher. Jesus, even more than David, was concerned for the glory of his father. He was able to say in John 17, 4, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Above all, like David, he was and continues to be a victorious champion. He took on the giants of Satan, sin and death. And through his death on the cross, those enemies were defeated. He won the victory on behalf of his people. What did the army of Israel need as they faced Goliath, knowing their own sin and their own weakness? They needed a savior. They needed God's anointed champion to win the victory for them. And that's who David was for them. For us, David's victory isn't recorded primarily to encourage us to be like David so that we can defeat any, any enemy that we face, but rather it encourages us to realize that we too need a champion. And that champion, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ who has defeated uh, those foes that are greater than Goliath, foes of Satan, sin and death. God's Son, Jesus Christ, is the champion that we all need. He has won the ultimate, the absolute victory over sin, Satan and death. Just as the rest of the Israelites were able to be part of the victory that David won, uh, that God's anointed man, David, won. Uh, and they were able to join in when Goliath was defeated. So by God's grace, we, if we're God's children, share in Jesus' victory over sin, Satan, and death. Not everyone, of course, gets to share in that victory. Those on Goliath's side suffered when their champion was overthrown. And each one of us today needs to be sure which side we are on. Are we by the grace of God 
on the side of God's absolute champion, the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are we still on Goliath's side, still defying the living God? The good news today is that if that is your position, by God's grace it is possible to change sides, to be transferred to the side of God's anointed champion. You need to cry out to God for mercy and forgiveness for having rebelled against him and defied him uh, in your life up until now and ask him to make you a follower of his absolute champion, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, our final psalm is Psalm 18. Uh, we're going to be singing Psalm 18 from stanza 25 to 30. And the tune is Perfect Way. 185. This again is, is a psalm of David. This was a psalm that was written when God had given David victory over all of his enemies. Uh, so it is written much later in his life. Uh, but it reflects some of the things that he experienced in his, his victory uh, over Goliath. Um, he refers to God as his, the one who assists him, uh, enables him. Uh, to fight in, in stanza 25. Uh, he speaks of God as his rock. Uh, he says that God is the one who clothes him with strength. He's the one who trains his hands for war. So God is the one who has enabled him to do great things uh, for God. And he's uh, the one who is the one in whom he trusts and depends. And he, he, he will be a rock uh, for us if we trust in him also. Let's uh, sing these words then, stand and sing these words from Psalm 18, 25 uh, to, to 30, and then we'll remain standing for prayer. <clears throat> Thank you even more especially for the victory that you gave your son, the victory that he achieved through his life, death and resurrection over Satan, sin 
<coughs> Satan and sin. Uh, and uh, we rejoice in that victory. And we thank you that as his people we share in the benefits of that victory uh, today. So Lord, we pray that you'd help us as we go out into this uh, week. We pray that you'd help us to have our faith and our trust firmly in him. And we pray that we would not go forward in our own strength and our own confidence, but that our faith and our confidence would be uh, based on him and in him alone. We pray that you would be with us and help us to walk in your ways in this uh, week that has begun. Help us to glorify you in all that we do. And now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.